Man has made the planet and everything on it his subject. Livestock supply us with meat, milk and leather. Around two million years ago, when our ancestors were beginning to walk upright across the African plains, an energy-rich food was discovered, meat. It started with Erectus and early Homo with uh, cutting the, the meat with stone tools, uh, grinding the meat, pounding the meat. Today, around 800 million livestock are slaughtered every year in Germany alone. Many have been supplying the market for years with their eggs and milk. Vegans don't eat meat, don't drink milk, and even deny themselves that breakfast egg. For me, consuming milk and other dairy products is animal cruelty. It doesn't matter if it's conventional, organic or biodynamic milk. For most city dwellers, their only contact with livestock is when they drink some milk or the steak is already sizzling in the pan. And I'm one of them. I love cooking. Many vegans manage without using any animal products at all. Does this mean they have a healthier, better life? In the US, the vegan wave has long since become a tsunami. It's a billion dollar industry. No wonder the first biotech company settled in California, developing alembic, meat and dairy products. So is veganism really healthier, more ethical and environmentally friendly than the consumption of mass produced meat products? Between the Place de la Bastille and the Place de la Nation in Paris, the Marché d'Aligre takes place six times a week. France's culinary specialties can all be found here. The daily market is a temple of the French way of life and culture. A culinary culture that is admired across Europe, even across the whole world. Deborah Pivin is a great admirer of French cuisine. The American has been living in Paris for almost 40 years and demonstrated her American pioneering spirit when she opened a gourmet vegan restaurant in Paris. Actually, opening a vegan restaurant in Paris meant mastering absolutely a vegan cuisine and French cuisine. And people, what they love about French food is the essence, the spirit of it. Uh, it's the technique. Uh, very good products and uh, a whole history of tastes and textures and sensations. So because um, I love the foundation of what vegan means uh, and I love Paris, putting the two together was just um, as perfect as you can get. As vegans use no animal products at all, they often make do with plant-based dairy substitutes in the kitchen. Are they as easy to cook with as our standard dairy products? We have no problem making creme brulee. Cakes, the macaron, the uh, pâte à choux, which is used to make eclairs. No problem. Uh, people are, were ecstatic about it. And where would we have difficulties? Well, um, cheeses are the only thing that we are still youngsters um, at. And it's just going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of um, chemistry to learn how to make them uh, with all the variety. Because the French do have 486 varieties of cheese. So it's taken over a thousand years to do that. It's going to take us a couple years. Vegan cuisine is unbelievably diverse. It has to be. All animal products are replaced with plant-based ones. Those who want the flavor of a schnitzel do not have to forego the taste. The secret is in the spices and the technique that enables you to replicate the consistency of meat. After all, you eat with your eyes too. Firm and tasty. This is pizza dough that you put into water and knead. It takes up the starch. Then you're left with a mass that you can fry and which tastes like pork. And then it tastes like Schweinefleisch. 
Even dessert is not something vegan chefs have to shy away from. It just tastes different. White vegan chocolate. With this skill, there are always new delights for the palate to be discovered. The vegan kitchen is in no way behind conventional cuisine, either it tastes or it doesn't. But as there is more to eating than just nutrition, it's worth taking a look behind the scenes of a vegan kitchen. The blue lupine is a special plant. Farmers used it as a protein-rich pig feed. It was very bitter, which is why the pigs didn't like it. The Fraunhofer Institute for Processing Technology and Packaging has upgraded the local plant to a sweet lupine and made it suitable for human consumption. Lupine seeds are flaked and undergo several processing stages so the rich protein can be extracted. An established technique that proved useful in developing the process was decaffeination. To extract the protein from sweet lupines, they first need to be de-oiled, similar to the soybean. Usually various solvents are used with soya to remove the oil. We wanted to find a more environmentally friendly alternative and stumbled across the overcritical CO2. It is used for extracting the caffeine from coffee. With the lupines, we use it to remove the oil and other aromas and improve the plant's taste. It was through cultivation, not by means of genetic modification, that the scientists succeeded in reducing the bitterness of the sweet lupine. This gives us a protein that can be turned into lupine milk. The proteins are nice and flaky now. Those who want to make a milk substitute not only need more protein, but also oil and sugar. Adding water produces a white liquid that can be processed like milk. Lupine milk competition for any dairy farmer. But since the milk prices have hit rock bottom, the farmer is grateful for any alternatives. More and more farmers are considering growing the sweet lupine. It makes economic sense. Especially in the sandy soil in northeast Germany, the sweet lupine is now en vogue. As a new field crop, the lupine takes nitrogen from the air and passes it onto the sapped soil. For this reason, farmer Sebastian Greve barely needs any pesticides and still has a larger harvest. Next year there will be rye growing here and we can assume that we will generate 150 euros more from the areas where we had lupines growing. For farmer Greve and his client Mark Tillmann, it's a win-win situation. The sweet lupine is an indigenous plant, so we can use protein from the region. It's also a great functional plant that can really produce milk. Just imagine, you have milk that's made of water, milk fat, milk protein, milk sugar, and all of that needs to be reproduced if you want a milk substitute. The sweet lupine seeds are easy to store and process. This is about 30 tons. What can you make from 30 tons? 30 tons make about 150,000 liters of milk, so that's quite effective. Only a few kilometers from the fields where the lupine grew, the lupine milk is produced. This is where the basis for lupine yogurt, lupine cocoa, and lupine ice cream is made. 
Lupine milk can be used just like normal milk that comes from a cow. I can make my rice pudding with it, I can eat it with my muesli or drink it cold out of the fridge. There's no limits to how I can use it. That's the advantage, as I don't have to give anything up. Plant-based nutrition is no longer associated with sacrifice, but with pleasure. Although the lupine platter is limited, there are ecological benefits to the local lupine not offered by other important protein-rich alternatives, such as soya. 35 million tons of soya are imported by the EU each year, mainly from South America. Most of it is for livestock fodder. Large areas of rainforest have been burnt down to make way to farm the monoculture. Surface areas that once soaked up CO2. The majority of the beans have been genetically modified, yet the need for new pesticides does not abate. Soy is an important raw material for many food products, such as baked goods, dairy products and cereal bars. To process the beans into protein products, they need to be de-oiled. So far, the oil is dissolved in the toxic chemical hexane, which is not only harmful for the environment, but highly flammable. Ecologically sustainable, it is not. In many ways, Berlin is setting precedent. At the moment, the German metropolis is proving to be the vegan capital of Europe, Jan Bredak, a former manager from the automobile industry, is now head of a vegan supermarket chain and embodies this trend like no other. He wants to earn money with his enterprise, but at the same time make the world a better place. For 35 years, I myself drank litres of milk according to the old tradition. It's healthy. My grandmother always said that if I ate my dairy, I'd grow strong. These are rituals passed down, conditioned modes of behavior. For me, it was the old moment when you have this picture of a cow that stands in the field and eats grass and gives milk, and then when you realize that it's a mother's milk that she's giving, that picture is ruined. You realize that we inseminate cows, take their calves away from them, slaughter them, and then the cows stand there for five years before they're sent to the abattoir themselves. These are the things where you say, if only I'd known that earlier. And these things happen. For me, it was a wake-up call, and I think it's happening to a lot of people at the moment. Bredak wants to combine ethical principles with business principles, and that seems to be working very well. Matcha tea is the latest craze. 12 grams, and when we're at 120 grams, that's enough for 10 shots. Cheers. Krass. Fundamentally, you can say that we are niche. We come from a movement that protested to our society about food. That's where veganism comes from. For 20, 30 years, it was, I'm different, you're shit, I'm better because I eat differently. That was the elitist claim to be different. What we did is that we opened up the vegan world and made plant-based nutrition accessible to the masses. We tore down barriers and the preconceptions. And what is happening now is remarkable. Many people are coming to us who aren't vegan nor vegetarian. They're just curious to try the products, and that brings in consumers. We're tripling our revenue every year. Whilst Jan Bredak ratchets up his revenue, scientists in the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig are studying the deeper motivations of human eating behavior. Why do people eat meat and other animal products? Jean-Jacques Hublin is finding the answers in the prehistory of human evolution. The anthropologist delves deep into the past when apes were slowly becoming humans. Our brain is about five times the size it should be for a mammal our size, our body size. And the brain is a very expensive tissue in terms of energy. Um, it takes about 20% of our, uh, what we call basal metabolism, which is energy we produce at rest. 
And, and this is consumed by an organ that uh, represents only 2% of the body mass, so a huge cost. Our early ancestors were herbivore apes that lived in the trees. Two million years ago, Homo erectus was hunting small living animals on the forest floor, and brain size increased. Our ancestor would cut the meat from the bones with small stone tools. But the second spectacular phase of the brain growth of the Homo only happened after the discovery of fire and cooking over 500,000 years ago. The reason why cooking is so important is because cooking uh, facilitates the way we can incorporate this high energy, uh, this food high in, uh, in uh, rich in energy, uh, especially meat. And then we see another, I would say, acceleration in the, uh, in the, the brain size in hominins. Uh, in the course of the last half million year, there is a spectacular increase of the brain size without any uh, uh, related increase in the body size. So the proportion between brain and body change again. By studying the isotopes in human bones, the scientists can ascertain what humans were eating 500,000 years ago. And it becomes evident. From an evolutionary perspective, our metabolism is still in the Stone Age. We are good at storing fat for bad times. But as we no longer have to hunt for the food ourselves, but more often than not sit lazily on the sofa, we get ill. Our extremely high energy diet, combined with little movement, causes civilization diseases such as cancer or diabetes. So modern societies are facing new, a new challenge, which is changing our diet another time and, and, and somehow uh, designing a new way of, of uh, fueling our body and our brain, which is, uh, still um, needs energy but in a, I would say, a, a more uh, reasonable way, considering the, the way of life uh, modern humans have today. The way we're living at the moment is clearly not compatible with our evolutionary heritage. Many of us are too fat and suffer from all types of civilization diseases that are connected to our diet. At the Veggie World Trade Fair in Paris, the healthy diet of veganism is celebrated. But how healthy is being vegan really? Svancha Tomalak, the organizer of the fair, thinks she knows. Son pour la santé essentially means you cut something out for health reasons, as with veganism generally. But especially in France, many organizations are concerning themselves by talking more about it. Many people don't know what to do with the word veganism. For them, it is a question of, if we can't eat meat, then what do we eat? At the trade fair, the exhibitors are doing their best to convince people of the opposite. The vegan delicacies on offer are overwhelming, although this says little about the taste and health benefits of vegan food. The use of flavor enhancers, sugars, and fats can easily be compared to conventional cuisine. Nevertheless, the French seem curious. Generally, Germany is more advanced than the French market. This is because a lot more work needs to be done here, educating people. This is starting with recent media reports about scandals in organic slaughterhouses, where animals were treated very cruelly. A while ago, these pictures wouldn't even reach the public. For reasons such as these, vegans claim an ethical imperative and cry out for animal products to be avoided. Those who have seen the secret recordings made by animals' rights organization L214 
will certainly be put off their next stake. These clips were shown in the big daily news shows, and it really clicked for some people. It is the unbridled truth about modern milk and animal production which drives consumers to make more conscientious choices. Cosmetics, shoes, t-shirts, all made without any animal products. But going completely without animal products, despite all the urging to do so, is not as easy as it may seem. We're at Lake Constance. Anna Lena Klepp has made herself at home along the Swiss banks in Kreuzlingen. The vegan blogger wants to take a closer look at the first vegan hotel in Europe. The Hotel Swiss in Kreuzlingen is the first of its kind. I want to get my key. Number 31, third floor. Thank you. From a rich vegan breakfast to chair upholstery and soft pillows, no meat, no milk, no leather, no goose down, a vegan's dream. There's a wide choice of vegan alternative products. From milk to cheese, there's a substitute for everything, as even some vegetarians have a problem with cheese. But why? Vegetarians who are vegetarian because they do not want animals to die because of them get into an ethical dilemma when it comes to cheese. Many cheeses contain rennet, which comes from calves' stomach and for which the calves need to die, which means a lot of cheeses aren't even vegetarian. But why do vegans even try to imitate these types of food? You're used to eating cheese for breakfast and seek familiar products, especially in, in the changeover phase when you begin to eat vegan. Animal ethics doesn't come cheap, especially not in the hotel business. Any recognition goes a long way. Banishing all animal products makes the hand soap as well as the bed clothes more expensive. Goose down is not a necessity, and even the staunchest vegan can sleep easily. And bloggers like Anna Lina ensure that word gets around where vegans can find a good night's rest. Are you thirsty? How about a cool drink? Yes, please. We've got the highest quality. Is it local? Yes, it's all local vegetables. And you even do it with a stem and all? Even with a stem. Okay. <laughs> Cheers, nice that you're here. Once the initial formalities are over and the quality of the ingredients is fitting, the world of new flavours can begin. The added bonus that there is a focus on local produce combined with vegan ethical principles is a win-win situation. That wasn't even clear at the beginning. In the beginning, we wondered whether the vegan concept would be a disadvantage for a hotel. But in this border region, the vegan concept has been an economic chance to fill a niche and makes absolute business sense. The vegan wave is bringing new customers to businesses that are adapting. But can the business also be deadly? Every now and again, the public is shocked by stories of young children who were vegan and died from malnutrition. Can a purely vegan diet be dangerous or even lethal? Why did these children have to die? In Germany, scientists are seeking answers to these questions. Professor Bernhard Watzel is head of the Max Rubner Institute for Physiology and Biochemistry of Nutrition. 
Infants, small children, are growing organisms. Compared to adults, it's very important that all necessary nutrients are amply supplied in their diet. The need is especially high in small children, and an important example is vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is found in meat, fish, eggs and milk. A B12 deficiency causes tiredness, weakness and depression and can lead to irreparable damage in the central nervous system. Many dairy substitutes contain artificial B12. A chemical analysis shows a high level of industrial processing in these substitute foods. They are an artificial mix of substances that try to emulate the original, a mix that's not necessarily healthier. There's no scientific study that shows it's healthier to not drink milk. And ultimately, one food product won't determine whether your diet is healthy or not. Diversity is important. I need the vegetable part. I need the meat part. I can have a healthy diet without the animal part, but then I'm in a situation where I need supplements. That's necessary if you want to have a diet that's entirely plant-based. Nature really did intend for us to have a mixed diet, not to the extent that we are eating animal products today, we obviously have too much, but some meat in our diet is an essential foundation if you want to eat without supplements. So vegans are healthy when they use a toothpaste that contains B12, for example. Or they take vitamin tablets every day. For many, it's a better alternative to consuming milk. Alternatives that readily replace the function of milk are usually less beneficial in their makeup. They don't have the same concentration of the vital nutrients, are often technologically produced and less beneficial to one's health in comparison to the makeup of milk. Highly processed food does not have the reputation of being healthy. Daniela Kreil, consumer protectionist, explains. Soya was the first milk substitute. Now a wealth of other substitutes have been found. And if you look what's in them? Yes, one tries to imitate milk by adding flavorings, but also certain vitamins that are in milk, whether it's calcium or B12. These are vitamins that are vital when one is on a vegan diet. And there is, of course, sugar, to give it more flavor, around a cube of sugar for every 100 milliliters. These recipes are trying to emulate milk and its nutrients. These chemical recipes are expensive, and there are still problems with the taste of substitute cheese. Many vegans miss cheese. The base ingredient is a type of oil. So you need plant oil so it looks like cheese and tastes like cheese. And you can't do that without additives. And what are the additives? First, you need a thickener so the oil becomes a solid mass. And then natural colouring so it has a nice yellow cheese colour. More important is that you can't do it without flavourings, as plant oil doesn't taste like cheese, which is the taste we're trying to imitate. As vegan cheese isn't cheese and milk substitutes aren't animal products, they cannot be labelled as milk or cheese in Europe. Alexander Anton makes sure of it. He's a lobbyist for the European milk industry. Pleasure, flavor, health. This is the triad of milk. Milk is unique in its nutritional makeup, a product that is traditional, that we've been farming for 10,000 years, and that has a natural basis. All 1,200 French cheese varieties are made from the natural food milk. Whether soy, oat, or almond milk, there are concrete economic interests which have led to a true labeling war.
The description milk is only allowed with coconut milk for traditional reasons. There's no real disagreement on this. The situation is clear. The description of milk and milk products is consumer protected. As a consumer, I have to be informed that when I buy cheese, butter or milk, that these are real dairy products. Jan Bredak considers the argument as superfluous and not in the interests of the consumer. We're not allowed to write on our products that they're cholesterol-free, although they are. That would be a competitive disadvantage for the meat and dairy industry, as their products contain cholesterol. A second issue, relevant for me here in Germany, is the tax disadvantages. For a milk substitute, you pay 19% VAT. For milk from a sheep, goat or cow, you pay 7%. These are things that have been secured, where the lobbyists have done their work well. Consumer issues like these are negotiated in the corridors of the EU in Brussels and in court. It is a billion-dollar industry. The already shaken milk farmers in Europe are fighting for the image of milk as a quality product. Misdescribing products that rely on a good reputation, that have acquired the good image of milk, is not new. We've known this since the era of Napoleon III. For him, good butter was too expensive for his troops, so margarine was invented. Since Napoleon III, cheap margarine has conquered its place in many kitchens, and history seems to be repeating itself. This Rügenwalder Mill is a symbol for the traditional meat and sausage industry in Germany. The business has been undergoing radical change since its marketing and development head, Gordo Röben, added vegetarian and soon vegan meats to the company's repertoire. We've been producing meats for 182 years, and when I came up with the idea that we should make vegetarian products, there were murmurs of why, but the numbers justified so easily. It's not the 7 million vegetarians, the 1 million vegans, but the 40 million flexitarians that are saying, I want to consume less meat and sausage. A serious argument, as you don't want to lose them to the cheese and Nutella industry, but you want to offer them contemporary products. An appointment at the Rügenwalder base. A challenge for vegan blogger Annalena Klapp. I would like to see how seriously they take this. How do they even do it? How is the production of these foods different? And yes, what is the motivation? Every week, the company processes around 450 tons of pork and poultry. Pate and ham are ever the favorite classics. Annalena finds it hard to even look at these products. But the enterprise already has 11 meatless variations in its repertoire, two of which are vegan. It took three years for the first vegetarian sausage to be brought to the market. For Annalena, the change can't come fast enough. This is where the animals that you want to free are still processed. It is a funny feeling, but I think it is moving in the right direction. And I hope that in the future, animal products will decrease. A lot. And that one day this venture will only produce vegetarian or vegan products. However, the resistance against vegetarian and vegan products was considerable, even within the company. Yet, success was on Gordo Robin's side. The company has had to hire more staff to produce the non-meat products in three shifts. We haven't had much growth in recent years. We would have had about 1-2% plus. Now that we've introduced vegetarian products, our growth is in double figures. We make about 50 million euros a year with our vegetarian products. That's 20% of our total revenue. So there's really something happening in Germany. It's not about to stop. Aside from the vegetarian offer, the company is increasing its vegan platter. Vegan makes business sense. 
Vigan's founder, Predac, wants to conquer the European market with his vegan supermarkets. France is right at the top of the list. We're in talks with Carrefour. It's not that far-fetched. The interest is there, but there's more from Carrefour in Spain. But that has an effect on France. I say it's France's turn. In Berlin, this vegan future has already begun. Whether lupines or soya milk, plant-based cheese or meat substitute, the array of products is growing and sales are booming. Many others are jumping aboard the trend. Veganism is a trend, yes, but it's a mega trend, meaning we'll see it run a minimum of about 30 years. And if you look at the reason why people are changing their lives and their behavior, then the first priority is their health and their well-being. But environmental aspects are also being put on the table. Our consumption is leaving a footprint, and you can't wipe it away. There's more and more people in the world and not enough resources. And the focus on feeding animals means some people go hungry. Once we number 10 billion people in 20, 30, 40 years, the planet will be too small for us, and we will have to consume directly, meaning we have to eat plants themselves, because they have a much higher yield. For a kilo of meat, I need 16 kilos of grain and 20,000 liters of water. It's just not there. The argument of the animal ethicists is driving some to extreme measures. Jan Pfeiffer and Denise Weber from the German Bureau for Animal Protection have been fighting against the industrial farming conditions and the dairy industry for years. To prove offenses against animals on dairy farms, they break in and record footage. How many consumers know that calves are taken away from their mother right after their birth, and that cow's milk is mother's milk being withheld from the calves? A few things could happen, the farmer could be there, we could get caught, it's a risk. We're very, very careful, it's also our goal not to get caught, because that's exactly what the industry wants. They want to say, look at the activists that bring diseases in, and that's exactly what we don't want. The two activists are on the move again. This time, it's a nighttime operation in northern Germany. Careful preparation is needed to make sure no bacteria is brought into the dairy farm from outside. We have a camera with us, an infrared camera, just to show in what conditions the animals are kept, to give the consumer an authentic look behind the scenes. But first, the law has to be broken, as the two are trespassing onto an entirely unsecured dairy farm. The cows lie on two little straw with swollen udders that are unmilked. The calves have long been taken from their mothers and penned together into a neighboring stall. Ironically, the calves get low-fat milk powder as the valuable mother's milk is meant for human consumption. Everywhere, there is evidence pointing to mass medicating of the animals. A few of the calves seem to be suffering from extreme diarrhea. The sight of the calves that we have seen makes me very distressed and sad. But most of all, it makes me angry. I am angry at the people who are responsible. Primarily, that is, of course, the farmers, because they keep the animals this way, but also mainly the consumer. Just because he wants to drink milk and eat dairy products, the animals are kept like this, and that just shouldn't be. We don't feel like we're doing something forbidden here. We're just exposing what should be forbidden. Everything that one can see here should not be allowed. It shouldn't be, but yet it is. Which is why we're trespassing, to bring it to the public's attention. A new barn, new evidence. More suffering that the activists will put on their website and use against the dairy farmers. And then they make a gruesome discovery. Something that is a standard but little known part of everyday dairy farming. Oh, what's that? A very small calf. In Germany, the mortality rate of calves is around 15%. Far too high the animal rights activists say. Which is why they sometimes resort 
to vigilante justice. He saved Zwergi from a previous dairy farm. We found her in a so-called calf igloo. She would have suffered the same fate as millions of other cows in Germany. She would have been pulled through the milk production cycle, would have been artificially inseminated, would have been forced to bear calves to produce milk for the human consumers. Zwergi, the freed calf, now lives in an animal sanctuary somewhere in Germany. All the animals at this sanctuary have been freed. Many have spent years in crammed barns and can now live out their days without serving as livestock for the needs of the consumer. Well, not quite. Svergi and the other freed animals are perfect for a bit of vegan propaganda. For Anna Lina Klapp and her boss Sebastian Joy from the German Vegetarian Union, the animal sanctuary and freed animals are worthy of a story for their circular. Here, pictures can portray what bland numbers often can't. One tangible example says more than any statistics. Stalin once said, the death of one person is a tragedy, but the death of a million people is a statistic. It's just the same for animals. If you state how many animals, in Germany it's over 800 million, are slaughtered every year and eaten, it's an incomprehensibly large number. The individual can't grasp it. Whilst here in the animal sanctuary, you can see every animal, make a connection to it, and realize that it's a sentient being that just wants to live and be happy. The story is too good not to be used. We try not to point fingers, but reach out our hands. When we say, look people, just try replacing milk or eggs or meat with tasty alternatives. The arguments to do so are convincing. The consumption of animal products, milk and meat and eggs, produces more greenhouse gases than all transport, ships, cars, aeroplanes combined. A vegetarian diet can balance one's own carbon footprint by 50%, a vegan diet up to 90%. But what if we could eat meat whilst also preventing animal cruelty? Impossible. At the University of Maastricht in Holland, Professor Mark Post is working on a decidedly non-vegan alternative to save the planet and combat hunger, artificial meat made from cow's stem cells. All of us, but also cows, have in their muscle stem cells. They are designated skeletal muscle stem cells. They can only produce muscle tissue. And they, they, they're sitting there doing nothing, waiting to repair the muscle when it's injured. That's their role in life. They can do that inside the body, but they can also do that outside of the body. Professor Post presented the fruits of his labors to the world press in 2014. The first hamburger grown in the laboratory. Cost $250,000 for one patty. It took the scientists three months to grow the hamburger from the stem cells quicker than a cow would ever be able to do it. Fundamentally, the technique could also work with chicken and lamb. The possibilities are endless. So we have been able from that small very sample to culture um, sufficient cells for that hamburger. Um, and um, if you do the math, if you calculate, um, and the number of doublings that you can get out of these cells, uh, that small sample could produce 10,000 kilos of meat. Two stem cells could potentially become 10 tons of meat, and no cow, sheep or chicken would need to die for it. Will the meat of tomorrow no longer come from the barn or the field, but the bioreactor? What consequences does this technological breakthrough have for the environment? We have one and a half billion 
cows on this planet. Um, and this technology still would require some cows because they need to donate those stem cells. Uh, but you, can, you could go down from one and a half billion to say 30, 35,000 um, across the world. Could Mark Post's visions become a reality? Can the greenhouse gases caused by mass farming be drastically reduced? Artificial meat from bioreactors, ethical, efficient and ecological. Could eating meat be a way to prevent animal cruelty and save the planet? Only if it tastes good and comes cheap. With the current technology, if we scale up, the cost would be about $65 per kilo, so about 50 euro per kilo, which is still expensive. It's still 30 times more expensive than what we have right now, but that's with the current technology. And we already know um, which um, innovations we need to, um, we, we are looking for to get that price down. The consumption of animal products such as meat, milk and eggs creates more greenhouse gases than all transport, ships, cars and aeroplanes combined. And some people are already dreaming of making milk and cheese in bioreactors. No animals needed at all. I think it's actually a great idea to make the milk proteins by bacteria or yeast or whatever organism um, it, it is is used to produce that and add water and, and other substances and fat maybe to, to create the same product. Um, I think that's a great idea because milk is a problematic, um, probably as problematic as meat is a problematic um, uh, commodity. The Bay Area around San Francisco is one of the world's hotbeds of innovation. This is where the computer revolution of the 20th century took place. Apple, Intel, Google and Co. In the 21st century, the biotech revolution is to follow the digital one. And once again, it all starts in an old garage. Near Berkeley University, biohackers come together to make vegan cheese out of marine mammals. What may seem impossible at first glance could become a reality when you take a closer look. The narwhal is just because it's kind of cool, because we can do it. Um, we can do any uh, mammal that has had its genome sequenced. Um, and so this was really sort of to get people excited about the idea. Hey, we can do something really different because, um, yeah, it's probably very hard to milk a narwhal. I don't think anybody's ever made narwhal cheese before. So this is showing that not only can we reproduce things that already exist in the world, you know, cow milk cheese, we can do some really new things that are really only possible this way. This is pretty much like the Modern gene technology yeah, makes it possible, time. as does the internet. One can buy genetic mammal material, exactly the part that codes the milk proteins. Proteins that can be mass reproduced within bacteria or yeast cells. It's pretty easy to order the plasmid complete with your gene of interest in it. So that's what we've done here. So it's got that gene that tells the yeast how to make this particular protein. And it's got a few other features too. It, uh, it actually tells the yeast, once that protein's made, kick it out of the yeast cell. But that makes it easier to purify afterwards. At no stage in the process is an animal involved. Theoretically, it should be possible to genetically create vegan milk proteins in yeast cells, just as insulin is being produced in yeast cells already. Today, the biohackers from the counterculture lab in Berkeley are locking a human breast milk protein into a yeast cell. It would be the first component of artificial human breast milk that together with plant oil, sugar and water could form the basis for a vegan cheese. Five, four, three, two, one. That's it, right? 4.9, almost exactly right. Time. Awesome. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, so now we've and pulled I'm still out. Alive. <laughs> the theoretical path to making vegan cheese is known. The practical implementation with donated equipment from the biotech industry seems controllable, possible. Even the implementation of a protocol by a colorful mix of academic amateurs biocomputer scientists, geologists, software engineers and chemists is possible. Yet, milk proteins are very complex. If it were that simple, we would already have vegan cheese.
A long and rocky road lies ahead. The real challenge of those will be isolating the proteins, getting them really pure after they come out of the yeast, because of course the yeast is making other protein as well. Uh, and then reconstructing these several proteins to make the larger protein structure. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been done in the literature from when these proteins have been isolated individually uh, from the mammalian sources, but we've never done it from yeast. And if we get everything exactly right, it will work the same way. But you know, if anything's a little bit different, we may have to do some extra work to mm. reconstruct those micelles. So the relevant American supervising body, the FDA, has no concerns regarding vegan cheese, but cheese from human breast milk meets resistance. These are cultural reservations that weigh heavily on this. As heavily as the reservations of many a Frenchman about a vegan cooking school being set up in Normandy, the heart of the French milk and cheese industry. This is exactly what Deborah Pival has done. She's convinced that fantastic French cuisine does not have to exhaust itself by serving ortolan drowned in Armagnac forever. The universe of the vegan taste spectrum has barely been explored. Can we have every taste? No, right now we cannot have every taste. We cannot have every texture. But because we're so, you know, adventurous and we, we, we want to find new things, we do cooking with things that no one would ever have thought uh, of using before. So we are not uh, reduced to using a small amount of products. On the contrary, the, the, the door is wide open. In this sense, veganism could even be the key to a whole new gourmet cuisine.